morning, everybody. I'd like for us to look at what Jesus said to, to, to Thomas in reply to a question that he was asked. So uh, let's turn to John chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. It's John chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So Jesus is the way, the way to the Father. <clears throat> he is the way, and the way is a gift to us. Without Jesus and the sacrifice he made, there would be no way for us. There would be no hope. There is, however, and we must accept him, and we must not forget him. We must remember him and that sacrifice he made for us on the cross. We must remember he provided us a way. He commands us in 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25, do this in remembrance of me. So this morning, I encourage you to keep a clear and focused mind as you partake of this memorial. You bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for loving us and sending your son Jesus to earth for us. We ask that you would help us to keep clear minds as we take time to remember him. We thank you for this bread that represents Christ's body. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this cup that, that you've uh, given us as a memorial for your blood that was shed for us. We pray that you would bless it as we, and bless each one that partakes of it. In Jesus' name, amen.
A song before the lesson this morning is Blessed Assurance. It's on page 480. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Good morning. Good morning. If you would open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to Jay. He's allowed me to get away from the podium. I'm not a podium speaker. I don't possess the skill that Russell does. He can stand still and talk. I can't do that. So if you see Jay, he does a lot of things behind the scenes for us and just like to tell him thank you. Um, Book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. I'll go ahead and read those. Then they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up. He is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight 
and begin following him on the road. First thing I want to talk about is the word risk. Think about the word risk. You've heard it a thousand times in your life, maybe even more. Oh, you're taking a risk. Be careful. You're taking a huge risk when you do that. Statistics show that most people fail at business or don't even start a business because they are scared to take a risk. They miss an opportunity because of the fear of stepping out, the fear of taking a risk. Thomas Edison, developer of the light bulb, we all know that. <laughs> It's stated that he tried 2,000 times before he got the light bulb correct. Tried this, tried that, this failed, that failed, everything failed. He was interviewed one time after the discovery of the light bulb and his fame went essentially worldwide. How did you, how did you manage that? How did you fail so many times and still keep on going? And Thomas Edison looked up over his glasses and he says, what are you talking about, fail? I didn't fail. I found 2,000 ways that didn't work. <laughs> and he went on. So his mindset was different. He didn't see those as failures. He says, well, I know that doesn't work. Well, I know that doesn't work. At the top of your paper, or I want you to do some accountability here. Either if you don't have a paper, tell your neighbor, but at the top of your paper, if fear did not exist, what's the one thing you would do that is positive, that is moral, that is ethical, that is something you've always been afraid to do? If fear did not exist, write down the one thing you would do. Or... Tell your neighbor, if you don't have a pen and paper, just tell your neighbor, what's the one thing you would do if fear did not exist? Write it down at the top of the paper or tell your neighbor either one. Everybody has something. I've always been afraid to do this. I've always been afraid to do that. What's the one thing you would do if fear did not exist? Keep that at the top of your paper and keep that in mind. We'll come back to it later on. Actually, the, the sermon this morning I have to thank Norval for. Um, he asked a question in Sunday school several weeks ago, and it really got my mind to start thinking. He says, he asked the question, what does it cost to come to Christ? And almost immediately, myself and another person in, in, in the class, I said nothing, this other person said everything. And I got to thinking, wait a minute, that's two completely different answers. And after the service, we got, the, the two of us got to talking about it, and we have discovered we were both right. It doesn't cost you anything to come to Christ, but it does cost you everything to stay with Christ. Your life will change. A lot of your associations will change. Your mindset will change. It costs you those things. So we were both right. So then, we, uh, then I started thinking, well, wait a minute, there's an element of risk here. So if you look at verse 46, let's get into this a little bit. Verse 46, then they came to Jericho, as he, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. Nothing in the Bible is there by accident. So I started asking the question, why? Why would they put, then they came to Jericho, and then the very next sentence, and as they were leaving Jericho? Why was that significant? Why would you put that in there? Well, we showed up, then we left. <laughs> why would you put that in there? Well, I started doing some scholarly studies, and as you can see on the sheet, 1988, they did, through some archaeological digs, they discovered that there was a Jericho in the time of Joshua, and then there was a Jericho in the time of Jesus. Jericho was rebuilt. So it's a possibility that as they came to Jericho, meaning the old Jericho, 
They went past, and as they were leaving Jericho, it's a possibility that they were, he was leaving the old, he meant leaving the old Jericho, going into the new Jericho, which was rebuilt. Possibility. However, 1914, I like J.W. McGarvey's version in 1914, because it really talks about the risk that Bartimaeus was taking. It talks about the the, the fear that he must have had being a blind beggar, possibly blind from birth. There's some fear there. I grew up, my father was blind um, for most of my life, so I understand the fears of a blind man. So this, this really resonated with me. Bartimaeus was actually, by J.W. McGarvey in 1914, he was actively seeking Jesus' attention. J.W. McGarvey believes that Bartimaeus was positioned outside the road, outside of Jericho on the eastern side, because it was the time where people were going to Jerusalem for the celebration. So if you're a beggar, you're going to position yourself for the greatest opportunity, are you not? Think about, think about your daily lives. Do you position yourself for the greatest opportunity? You should. You try to. We all do. So J.W. McGarvey believes that Bartimaeus was possibly on the eastern side of Jericho where folks were coming into Jericho because he knew this is where the heaviest amount of traffic was. If I beg here, the chance is I will get the most change, the most feedback, the most benefit from it. Now, let's set the scene. Close your eyes. Let's get a little active learning going. It's Jericho. It's time of the celebration. You're Bartimaeus. That's why your eyes are closed. <laughs> You're Bartimaeus. You're sitting beside the road, possibly on the south side of the road. That's where my mind goes. People are traveling from right to left. You can hear the noise of donkeys and carts and people on, you know, people walking and the noises of people coming and going. All of a sudden, from your right, there's a large noise, a large crowd of people, because the Bible says he had a crowd of people with him, because several things had happened before he got to this point. Now, if you're blind, Jesus is most likely at the head of this crowd going by. If you're blind, when are you going to discover that it's Jesus of Nazareth, before he gets to you or after he's already passed you? Most likely after he's passed you. So then you're starting to inquire, asking people, pulling on robes and, and clothing and asking people, what's this noise about? Because remember, you're blind, you can't see. Somebody tells him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Jesus is going into the city. Okay, so Jesus has gone into the city. <laughs> by, and there's this large crowd J.W. McGarvey believes that Bartimaeus, being blind and in Jericho, he knew the layout of Jericho, so he possibly felt his way around the outside wall of Jericho from the eastern gate to the southern gate and positioned himself again because people going to Jerusalem went out the southern gate. So here's the blind man feeling his way around. He puts himself at the southern gate. You guys can open your eyes. So he feels his way around the wall by this man's study, puts himself at the southern gate. Why? Because he wants to position himself for the greatest opportunity. He hears that it's Jesus of Nazareth, and he's like, wait a minute, this is my chance. This is my opportunity. So he takes the chance, he takes the risk of stumbling over rocks and whatever else is outside the wall of Jericho to position himself on the southern slope of Jericho. Now, think about Bartimaeus for a minute. He has three things working against him. He's blind, he's a beggar, and he's in massive poverty, hence the reason why he's begging. This is symbolic of the massive... the the massive level of suffering that Bartimaeus is in, especially during the time period. A suffering, blind beggar. You can't fall much farther than that. He is down, he is face down in the dirt by life's standards. 
son of Timaeus, in that same verse, he's obviously well known in the community. He's begging on the road. Now notice that where it says that he's begging on the road. That's kind of a symbolic path. How many of us are on the path of life and we're merely beggars on the path of life? We are not living to the fullness that Christ has set out for us. We're struggling. We're face down. We have prints on our back where we've been walked on, walked over, run over, all those kinds of things. The things that happen to a beggar or a blind man. Stumbling into things, walking into things. So, verse 47. When he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, 47 and 48 kind of go together. 48, many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. I started asking the question, wait a minute, the verse says, when they told him it was Jesus the Nazarene, why didn't he say, Jesus the Nazarene, have mercy on me? Why didn't he say that? Because at some point, the word and the message of Christ had reached Bartimaeus. Because the title Son of David is a messianic title. If you know anything about messianic Judaism, the messianic Jew believes that Christ is the Messiah. So here are all these people saying, oh, it's Jesus the Nazarene. But when Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus, Son of David, Jesus knows, wait a minute, this man believes. This man has faith. This man believes. This man is taking a risk to identify himself with me. And Jesus knows where he's going. The, Christ, the, the, Christ, the crowd tells him to be quiet. Shut up. Be quiet. I'm sure they said a lot of other things to him that were probably highly inappropriate that weren't worth noting in the Bible. Well, why would they do that? Verse 48, if you move down, the resistance. It was not in the decorum of the time to scream and yell, especially if somebody that was of, not of notability. Jesus was a notable person in the short time that he was alive. It was indecorous to scream and yell at somebody. Oh, be quiet. Don't do that. That's disrespectful. It's also distracting because you notice in the Bible it says there was a crowd around him. People wanted their turn to have the audience of Christ. Here's this man yelling out. They were afraid they might lose their turn and this man may get in front of them. Some jealousy there, possibly. Jesus referred to as the Messiah. Most people didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. He was a great man, he was a prophet, but he wasn't the Messiah. Don't call him that. Be quiet. Don't call him that. And then the, possibly a king should not pay attention to beggars. This man's going to be a king. He doesn't mean to take, take time for beggars. He doesn't take time for people on the street. Be quiet. Don't be distracting. So they were re rebuking him. But, as you can see, Bartimaeus cried out even more. You notice in verse 48, at the end, he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. When it says all the more, most likely he raised his voice even louder, made a larger racket to gain the attention of Christ. Let that sink in for a minute. Do we try to gain the attention of Christ? Or do we sit by and miss the opportunity? That's right. You tell them. <laughs> Do we sit by and miss the opportunity? Or do we jump up and down, scream and yell, even though others say, yeah, that Jesus is a joke. That Jesus is a crutch. Well, yeah, but if you're lame, crutches 
quite the good thing. The determined Bartimaeus showed his faith. It was a demonstration of faith. He demonstrated, son of David, have mercy on me. I, he's saying, Christ, I believe in you. In front of all these other people who just thought he was Jesus of Nazarene. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than just son of David, have mercy on me. He is professing his faith in front of a large crowd of people with Christ there. That quote at the bottom by Martin Luther, if he have faith, the believer cannot be restrained. I love that. If he have faith, the believer cannot be restrained. He betrays himself. He breaks out. He confesses and teaches the gospel to people at the risk of life itself. The other day in Sunday school, Alice made a great comment that has resonated with me for weeks now. She said, we cannot escape death, so it had better be for gain. That stuck with me and stuck with me. It was incredible. I, I was just like, wow, one sentence, and I thought about it for weeks, literally. Because if you're, the believer cannot be restrained. Bartimaeus couldn't be restrained. There's a whole crowd of people saying, shut up, be quiet. Don't be, don't be rude. Bartimaeus, once again, Christ, I believe in you. Help me. Then we move on. The call, verse 49. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up. He's calling for you. Notice how the crowd changed their opinion just like that. Isn't that amazing? Conformity is a dangerous thing. There was a study one time where this guy did a, uh, I believe it was Stanford, he did a study over conformity, and he brought these people in, and he said, all you have to do is look at the screen and tell me which line is longer. And he had three lines, A, B, and C. Lined up 10 people in each group, and he said, just raise your hand and tell me which line is longer, A, B, or C. Well, what the one person on the end didn't know is the other nine had been told to, to purposely choose the wrong line. If A was the longest, choose B. 74% of the time, the person who didn't know that the other nine were in, in cahoots with each other, they would agree with them, even though they knew that line wasn't right. 74% of the time, they would conform to majority, even though they didn't know, or even though they they knew that line wasn't the longest, they would still say, yeah, B is longer. 74% of the time. Unless you're Bartimaeus, and then you're the other 26% that says, eh, no, he's not just Jesus of Nazareth. This is the Messiah. The other 74% are going, no, nah, it's just some guy who's going to be a flash in the pan. Jesus takes notice in verse 49. Notice he says, call him here. Notice Jesus doesn't come to him. He has him come to Jesus. Why? Notice in the Bible, Jesus doesn't ever say, sit down. I'll be there in a minute. He says, go. Take up your bed and walk. Arise, take up your bed and walk. Go into all the world. Even though the contrast is in the book of Matthew chapter 27 where the uh, centurion says, in sitting down, they watched him there to watch Christ die. The only time there's a sit down is when, you're, when they are on the other side of the thing. Christ always calls for action. So they called the blind man and said, take courage, stand up, he's calling for you. Verse 50, throwing aside his cloak... He jumped up and came to Jesus. I'm sorry, if you, my father was an old blind man. There wasn't much jumping that went on. Um, for the simple fact that if you can't see, you don't know where you're jumping. Bartimaeus dropped his cloak. 
Now, that, that's symbolic of his wealth. If he's a blind beggar living on the street, if he has a cloak, that's a large chunk of what he has. If you notice on the sheet, that cloak symbolized about half his wealth, that one cloak. If you notice back earlier in Mark chapter 10, the rich man, the rich ruler comes to Christ and says, what must I do? I've kept all the commandments. Christ says, sell, sell everything you have. He didn't actually mean to go out and physically say, here's my Bible, 25 cents, here's my chair, 30 cents, whatever. He meant sell your attachment to the things that you have and follow me. It was obvious by demonstration that Bartimaeus did just that. He sold his attachment. He dropped his cloak and came to Christ. He gave up half his wealth, left it laying right there and came to Christ. Notice why else did he drop his cloak? He allowed himself to be exposed. He was uncovered. Christ, this is me. As ugly as it is and as wrong as it is, this is who I am. And then the last thing, the, having the cloak on it, it hindered him from reaching Jesus through the crowd. He knew if he was charging through the crowd, his cloak was going to catch on every single person that was packed there. He didn't want anything between him and Christ. So he gave it up. He dropped it and he took off. I'm sure he had help. Blind man, I'm sure he was being guided by somebody. So then the next question, we're getting down to the meat of this. Are your steps to Jesus impeded by an obstacle? Think about that in your own mind. Is there something keeping you from Christ? Maybe something highly coveted, like a cloak. Keeps you, keeps you warm. It's about all that you have. Is there something keeping you from Christ? Ask that within yourself. I can't answer it for you. Your neighbor can't answer it for you. Only you can answer it for you. Christ asked him the question, what do you want me to do for you? The interesting thing about this is this is the exact same question he asked the sons of Zebedee just in the previous verses. What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> the interesting, here's the comparison. The sons of Zebedee wanted to sit on his left and right. They wanted to be equal, essentially equal to Christ. So by, by them asking that, they asked, Lord, give me what I want to make my life what I want it to be. In comparison, Bartimaeus was saying, Lord, have mercy on me. I am blind without you. I can't see. See the difference? There's a reason why Christ asked the exact same question two times in a row. He wanted to show that comparison. The people who wanted Christ to do for them, make it what I want. And the other man who said, without you, I'm useless. Massive comparison. Notice he says, your faith has made you well. He followed Jesus on the road. Symbolic, because notice when, G when Bartimaeus encountered Jesus, he was on the road. Symbolic, the road being symbolic of life. After the encounter with Jesus, he followed Jesus on the road. Same road, different traveler. Because there was a change. In the encounter, there was a change. Now, to ask this question, what would you answer right now if Christ were to ask you the same question he asked Bartimaeus? If you had audience with Christ, just you and Christ, there could be people standing around just as there was with Bartimaeus, and he said to you, what do you want me to do for you? What would you answer? What would you ask? If you had this one opportunity, you took the risk and cried out, and Christ turned and gave you the opportunity. Like all those stories where you rub the lamp, the genie pops out, give me three wishes. <laughs> but this isn't a genie, this is Christ. Christ says, what do you want me to do for you? 
What would you answer? Think about that. What would you risk to get the chance to be in the presence of Jesus? What would you risk to get through the crowd? What would you risk to get past the ridicule, to get to that point where you could answer that question? What would you risk? Another thought, another question to think about. What would you risk? Okay, flip your paper back over. Put your finger on that one thing that you would do if there was no fear. Look at it, put your finger on it, think about it for a minute. Remember when we started this out, I said, what is the one thing you would do if fear didn't exist? The most profound statement I have that I heard that was from a presenter at, at school pre presenting conference. He said, what's the one thing that you would do if fear didn't exist? And he had everybody name it. And then he says, now go do it. Think about that. So that one thing at the top of your paper, what would you do if fear didn't exist? I challenge you to go do whatever it is you wrote at the top of your paper. I don't need to know. That's for you. There was a quote one time that said, the greatest things in your life lie on the other side of fear. Bartimaeus, the greatest thing in his life lied on the other side of fear. He met with resistance, but he knew what was over there, what was inside the crowd, was much greater than the resistance he was facing to get it, the fear that he had to get it. He knew, and he went for it. I'll leave you with this uh, quote. <laughs> My dad always told me, and he, st he stole this quote from John Wayne. He always said, courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. Is there something between you and Christ that you're afraid of? Well, we're all afraid of something. Spiders, right here. <laughs> but there's something that we're all afraid of, something keeping, is there something you're afraid of that's keeping you from Christ? Have the courage to take on the fear. Thank you. Have this song that we're going to sing uh, after, here in just a second. Uh, thank you for that that lesson, Mark. And if there's anyone that wants to respond to uh, Christ's call today and help you conquer your fears, or if you need prayers uh, from this church for anything, why now would be a good time to uh, to make that known. Uh, let's all stand as we sing this song. <clears throat> When Jesus comes to reward his servants, whether it be noon or night, faithful to him will he find us watching with our lamps all trimmed and bright. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? If at the dawn of the early morning he shall call us one by one, when to the Lord we restore our talents, will he answer thee? well done. Oh, can we say we are ready, brother, ready for the soul's bright home? 
Say, will he find you and me still watching, waiting, waiting when the Lord shall come? Okay, you can be seated now. We can take up the offering. Now is the time that we uh, do our giving. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, don't feel obligated to give. It's just the joy and duty of the, the members here. Um, JL, would you lead us in prayer? Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the blessings that you've given each one of us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless these gifts that are brought today and Help us, Lord, to use them to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Four announcements all reminders that's in your bulletin uh, reminder of a Wednesday evening classes now start at 730 and also got an upcoming event it's an area wide leaders church lunch uh, Saturday April 2nd 2016 at the Church of Christ in Dodge City Kansas and also there's several activities of Silver Maple Camp coming up and if anyone's interested check that out and uh, talk to Colleen any other announcements need to be made today? If not, please let's all be standing while Brother Norval leads us in closing prayer. Let's pray. Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your great and holy name. Very thankful, Lord, for the good lesson we heard today. Thank you for Mark and for his uh, time and effort in bringing this lesson to us. We pray, Lord, that we can overcome our fears, that we can be fruitful servants in your vineyard, that we can spread the word and, and encourage others to respond to it. We're thankful for the food that has been prepared. We pray that as we partake of that, we, our bodies will be strengthened, and then help us to see ways to use our bodies in your work. We ask for forgiveness of any wrongs that we have done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 